Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, it's entitled, Is Your Site Prep Helping or Hurting Your Longleaf Pine Restoration? Uh, my name is Karen Zellox brown I'm the resource specialist for the Longleaf Alliance. And I'm joined here by Jacob Barrett, also with the Longleaf Alliance. Jacob is our technical assistance and training specialist. Um, he'll be monitoring uh, some of the chat today. And today we're very happy to have a talk from Nathan Klaus. Nathan is a senior wildlife biologist from the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. Um, he has extensive experience managing for and studying longleaf pine ecosystems and wildlife dynamics, particularly avian populations. Um, his work on, on this subject, herbicide options during longleaf establishment um, was presented in the 2016 Biennial Longleaf Conference in Savannah. And it's a subject um, that's uh, become a very useful two-page publication by the same name. Um, and I can say that that we cite his work often um, on this topic during our longleaf management um, site visits and, and interactions with landowners um, wrestling with this question too. So, uh, so I know it's very useful to us. Um, before I turn the screen over to Nathan, I just want to remind you that um, your mics and your video as, as viewers has been turned off. Um, so just please keep those off during the presentation to help things run smoothly. Um, if you're seeking continuing education credits for this webinar, we do have one hour approved from SAF, Georgia Master Timber Harvester, and New York Logger Certification. In order to get those, just please stay on, on this link at the close of the webinar. It will return you back to the portal and you can finish those steps to get those credits. Um, we'd love to take your questions during the talk. Um, so if those come up, uh, please use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen um, on the toolbar, either on the top or bottom of your screen um, to put those in. And uh, Jacob's gonna be monitoring those and um, we'll have time for that uh, at the end of the program. Um, we also hope to share kind of a virtual field tour um, at the end of Nathan's presentation uh, to show some of these uh, study sites. So we'll be including that as well. Um, this session is being recorded and it will be available uh, for later viewing on the webinar portal um, in the next couple of days to a week to make that available. Um, so Nathan, if you're ready, I will um, share your, your talk and we can get started. And just let me know um, as you want those slides changed. Okay, sure will. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. Welcome everybody. I'm really um, humbled and, and grateful that you would join us today to, to hear about some of the research I've done um, on longleaf pine restoration. Um, so if you don't know me, I've, I work for Georgia Department of Natural Resources and I've been here for about 25 years. Uh, it's a rare thing these days, I think, that people uh, stay in a job that long, but I really like the job I'm in and um, get to do a lot of really neat projects. and, and um, one of the benefits of that is that um, I get the opportunity to do longer term research, I think, than what um, happens a lot of times in academia. It's, it's just rare, you know, so much of the uh, research being produced is done by masters or PhD students and, you know, two or three field seasons, you know, it's a lot of work, but it's not long enough to look oftentimes to truly really appreciate um, changes in ecology, changes in forestry. Um, and so, my job affords me that opportunity. That's something I've been really grateful for. Uh, next slide. So we all know um, about planting longleaf, hopefully, uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about longleaf restoration, which is different from planting longleaf. But we'll start, we'll back up and get, go over some of the basics. So we all know planting longleaf is expensive. You might be looking at a couple hundred dollars an acre for seedlings and planting. Uh, another about that about an equal amount uh, as much as 250 an acre for site prep and it's not always easy um, failures are still unfortunately common sometimes especially when we've got a bad drought um, and we all I think appreciate that site prep is a really critical part of planting success if you don't do good site prep um, your odds of successfully establishing longleaf isn't very good next step so it's important though to recognize that planting of longleaf pine is not restoration of the longleaf pine ecosystem. And a lot of times um, we get a little too overzealous in site prep. We're worried about ensuring we get good longleaf survival. And in the process, we might end up uh, doing damage to the site 
we restore the longleaf, but we destroy the ecosystem. And so that's kind of where that sort of cheeky title of that of this talk comes from is, you know, is your longleaf pine site prep hurting or helping your restoration? And unfortunately, a lot of times I found my site prep is, is, is hurting their restoration, at least it has been back when I was following a different playbook. Next slide. So um, one thing to back up and, and, and understand is what is ground cover? And hopefully most of you know what that is. If you've been out in the woods in the last couple of weeks, your pants are covered with it, right? All the desmodium stick into our pants. Um, ground cover are low growing plants. Most of them are herbaceous, but some of them are woody. And that they're, they're gonna be in a longleaf ecosystem. They're associated with frequently burned, healthy longleaf pine. And so it's gonna be hundreds of species, about 900 species of plants have been documented in open longleaf systems. And grasses are, are key to that ground cover. They're the backbone of the ecosystem, even more so in a lot of ways than the longleaf pine. The ground cover is constantly changing depending on time since fire, time of year. And I can't uh, state this any strong, more strongly than, I, than I'm going to, it's impossible to restore. Once good ground cover has been wiped out, uh, it will never be the same again. Uh, in fact, it's very difficult to get most of it back at all. Next slide. And so here's an example of good ground cover. This is on Sand Hills Wildlife Management Area, a place that I manage, and the Lightress are putting on a spectacular show. You can see the grasses down below and a little solid ego peeking in from the side there. Ground cover is beautiful. Healthy, healthy ground cover is spectacular. Next slide. So here's another uh, show, shot. This is on Sproul Bluff, WMA, where we're um, actually in the process of reintroducing red cockaded woodpeckers. Um, Something I'm really excited about. It'll be the first time these birds are found on Pine Mountain in 50 years. Um, hopefully they're gonna be arriving in December. But what I wanna draw your attention to is the ground cover. Look at that gorgeous landscape. Look at that, this, how, how diverse it is, um, how grassy it is. And you can see that there's even longleaf pine coming up through, through it. And that's you know in some ways part of the ground cover also is your regeneration. Next slide. And so a lot of things depend on ground cover, most notably insects. And if you just look at the Lepidoptera, which admittedly are a very small proportion of the insect community in a longleaf forest, um, you know, nearly all these species are depending on a plant as a host plant uh, for their larval stages. And those insects, next slide, support our wildlife populations. And so whether you're interested in, you know, uh, flatwood salamanders or southern hognose snake or bobwhite quail, um, or red cockaded woodpeckers, those plants are the backbone of our ecosystem. A great example of this is red cockaded woodpecker. Um, I, I can't remember, I'm sorry if you're in the audience, but I, there's been some great research on RCWs over the years. And one of them that really caught my attention was that uh, looking at fledgling weights of, of red cockaded woodpecker chicks, and they were um, relating that to ground cover quality. And what they found was that RCW chicks coming out of nests that are situated in good ground cover came out um, bigger, you know, they weighed more, and so they've got a better shot at life. That's a great example and a very simple example of, of the complex relationship that ground cover has with our wildlife populations. Next slide. Another thing to note about ground cover is that it's distinct among the 114 described longleaf pine associations. There may be more by now. It's been a while, been a little while since I looked it up, but you know, you've all heard of longleaf wiregrass, and maybe you've heard of longleaf blue stem, and maybe you've heard of montane longleaf. But there's actually over a hundred different flavors, if you will, of longleaf pine ecosystems, and every one of them has its own unique assemblage of ground cover. And so, when when ground cover is wiped out, it's not something that you can buy from a store and put back. It's um, it's unique to the place that that we're that we're working on restoration, and so conserving it is really um, a worthwhile activity. Next slide. Um, as long as soil disturbance isn't too bad, ground cover generally benefits from timber harvest, thinning, clear cutting, anything that's going to put more light on the ground is going to benefit ground cover. And even in a site like this, it's not going to be long before ground cover starts to come back. Next slide. Um, it's not long before you get a flush of vegetation after a harvest. Some of it is desirable ground cover, some of it is not. And so, you know, our old way of looking at things is, you know, we ask, how can we control this competition to get better planting survival? But maybe a better question to ask is, 
how can we get get good planting survival and good ground cover survival as we work through the restoration process? And an important note here is that I'm not at all advocating for no competition control. Um, you'll see in some research I present a little bit later that um, untreated controls don't fare very well. And I think we all know that. Next slide. So um, one of the, there's really two uh, general categories of ground of um, site prep. One of them is mechanical um, and the other is chemical. And I'm going to go more into chemical, but you know, mechanical, there's all sorts of different tools out there from shears and root rakes, the drum choppers. Um, and uh, these are great ways to get long leaf established. And some of them can do it without damaging ground cover too much. Next slide. This is an example of a savannah plow or bedding plow. And it's what, unfortunately, one of the more commonly used forms of mechanical site prep. There's no denying the science that it gives you generally good survival and growth. Next slide. But uh, the impact is substantial and lasting. Um, you know, you look at a place like this and you just, you, you know, we're all outdoors people. We've, we've watched the land over the years. You know that this isn't going to go away. This is going to be here for 10 generations or more. You know, your great, great grandchildren's great, great grandchildren are going to be living in the world where this is still around. And you know, it might seem like a good decision in the short term, maybe, you know, if you're thinking heavily, leaning heavily towards improving growth. Um, but having said that, um, you know, those those great, great grandchildren may feel differently, you know, when you're four or five rotations removed from this. Um, and there are the less intense ways to do it um, that that will give you still give you really good survival and growth. Next slide. So let's talk about chemical site prep. Um, these days, it's uh, often done with helicopters or skidders or backpack crews. Next slide. And they're going to be, there's just a, a few basic herbicides that are really, you know, 99% of the site prep that's done uh, for forestry, including longleaf and including restoration. Um, if you don't know these herbicides, maybe grab your phone real quick and snap a picture of this slide. I'm going to talk through them real quick because um, they're confusing. And it's, there, it's really, they shouldn't be. There's really, you know, in our study and, and in a lot of um, most, most site prep, there's really these kind of five, four or five really big players that are used most often. Um, and it's confusing because uh, there are chemical names. So those are the things that I've underlined and put in bold. And then there's all the marketing that goes around those chemicals. So glyphosate, we all know it's the roundup that we, you know, might spray on dandelions and our sidewalks. Uh, but it also comes in a lot of different formations, formulations that are used for other purposes. So Accord is a very common uh, form of glyphosate that's used for, for site prep. Um, Razor Pro, Ranger Pro are also different spinoffs of glyphosate. They all basically do the same thing. They're just used in different applications. And so it's, not, it's understandable that a, a lot of people get kind of befuddled with so many different names for the same thing. Um, Amazopir is another one that's widely used. Uh, it, there's some of the some of the marketing names for Amazopir include Alligator, Chopper, Arsenal, Polaris. Triclopyr is another one that's often used. Uh, some of the marketing names for that are Garlon 3A, Garlon 4, Garlon XRT, and it's in a lot of mixes also. Hexazinone is one that you don't encounter nearly as often. It's actually a pretty good herbicide for site prep in a lot of ways. Um, Pronone and Velpar-L are two formulations of it. Met metsulfur and methyl or MSM is uh, another uh, chemical that's used widely in site prep. Uh, its most common brand name is Escort, but actually it's mixed into a lot of other products, uh, Pastora and Oust and some other things um, like that. So, or out, anyway, um, I think I misspoke on Oust. Anyway, um, talking about these, these five herbicides. Um, glyphosate is a really uh, broad spectrum herbicide. It kind of gets you the scorched earth to look. It kills uh, grasses, it kills broadleaves, it kills woodies, it kills just about anything it gets it gets on the foliage of. It's, a, it's not soil active, it's just a foliar. Amazopyr, um, unlike glyphosate, amazopyr doesn't kill loblolly pine, so you can go over the top of loblolly pine with it, and that's certainly one of its selling points. But it is very broad spectrum. It kills grasses, it kills broad leaves, it kills most woody competition. It is uh, reputed to be a little gentler on legumes. Um, 
and we'll see some of that in, in a minute. Triclopyr is, um, it, well, let me back up, a is a, as a soil active herbicide, so it, it works by getting on the foliage and on the soil and, and pulled in through root systems. Triclopyr is a uh, another foliar, non-soil active. One of the nice things about it is it does not kill grasses, um, but it does a pretty good job on broad leaves and woody competition. Hexazinone is a soil active herbicide that generally goes after broad leaves. It doesn't kill grasses. It's um, it's pretty good on woodies, especially oak. And then metsulfur and methyl, or MSM, uh, is more often thought of as like a, a sort of a something extra you throw in. If you really want to hammer something, you maybe use glyphosate and then you throw in some MSM also. And metsulfur and methyl is particularly good at dealing with blackberry, which is nice. If you've ever been in some of these sites that have been prepped with things that favor blackberry, MSM will take care of that problem. Um, it does uh, kill or badly damage longleaf if it gets on the foliage of it. Um, it's debatable whether or not it's soil active. The, some people say it is. We use it all the time under longleaf, under vulnerable hardwoods, and it don't ever see any effect whatsoever uh, from MSM on if it's used you know, under you know as an understory spray. But anyway, those are the five. Uh, that I'm going to be talking about today, and I'm going to try to uh, stick to just using the underlined bolded uh, names for these things to hopefully minimize confusion. Next slide. So here's an example of some site prep that, that I took a photo of. I guess I'm kind of a strange bird. I'll pull over on the side of the highway and take a picture of site prep when I'm driving by, but maybe you do too. Um, you can see this site the edge of it, you can see kind of what was there in the foreground and what got blasted in the background. This was a glyphosate broadcast spray. I can tell because I actually, um, on the top right, you can see a, a pine that sort of, you know, has up into the sky and you can see it, it died from that. So um, that's, that's fairly typical of glyphosate. You can just tell by what things survive and what things don't survive. Um, oftentimes what was used. And in this situation, there wasn't much that survived. Broadcast, broadcast glyphosate is a sort of, like I said, kind of a scorched earth approach to site prep. Next slide. Here's a, um, a slide of um, also glyphosate and probably triclopyr in the mix. And you can see uh, this is in Southern Rough, which is sort of one of the worst case scenarios that, that we deal with in trying to restore. The competition can be hard to control. Um, this one, it, uh, you can you can see the tri effect of the triclopyr on this on the palmetto in the foreground where it's sort of burned back but not dead. And if you look in the background, you can see that actually a lot of it, a lot of the woody competition didn't quite get killed, but the overstory did. You can see there are a lot of whips and things that, that the loggers skipped over. And when they did an aerial application, those um, canopy trees, for lack of a better word, intercepted a lot of that herbicide and um, and kept. A lot of the problematic species, the woody stuff in the ground cover, from being um, controlled. And so you can imagine this isn't probably going to work out very well if, if, if tree seedlings are planted in there. Um, that's a good example where a foliar application didn't um, didn't kill the stuff in the ground, whereas maybe something like a mazapir that's soil active might have actually had a different effect. Next slide. So here's a third picture of some of some site prep that was conducted, and and you can see some some crispy looking sweet gum in the background. And um, but I'll draw your attention to the lower right. You can actually see a legume there that's still alive. It's yellow. It doesn't look very happy, but it's still alive. Um, that would indicate to me that this was an amazapir site prep. And so amazapir, it's not to say that it doesn't um, impact legumes. It does, but it tends to not kill them a lot of times. And unfortunately. Uh, this this legume was actually Cerisia lespedeza, a really wretched invasive exotic species um, that survived as a result of uh, you know be, amazapir being used. You can also see though that there's really no grass um, surviving, and it did a pretty good job on controlling woodies. Um, but you can see it's not quite as as um, uh, wholesale uh, control as what you'd see from glyphosate. Um, all right. And one thing you could notice also is that for all of these that, you know, if, you, if you're, you know, uh, sensitive to these sorts of things, all these site preps look like they were done kind of in late summer, early fall. And that's that's fairly typical. Most of these chemicals are most effective when applied, you know, during the growing season, kind of late in the growing season like that. Next slide. So um, the typical scenario is, you know, after a site prep, very oftentimes you get a, a 
a site prep spray, you can, you do control burn to get a little bit um, cleaner planting site. Next slide. And then the planters show up and get to work. Next slide. And next spring, this is what you're looking at. You got your, your long leaf in the ground. Uh, looks like it's green and up okay. It looks fairly healthy and happy. It looks like the competition is fairly controlled around it. Um, is that competition we need to worry about? Um, is that competition around a ground cover that we want to keep? Um, the answer is actually no to both. Um, and we've hit a bit of a problem here in this photo if, if restoration is the guideline. Where did our ground cover go? And what is it that is that is there? What are those, those plants, those herbaceous plants that are there? And do they matter? Um, next slide. So anyway, um, here's here you are a few years later, and um, hopefully you got the, the competition under control. Maybe you, your ground cover is starting to make it come back, some of it anyway, and your, your long leaf is starting to grow and everything's happy. Anyway, that's the, the fairly typical approach to, to planting long leaf that, that probably most of us have done at some point in our career. Next slide. So let's talk again, let's back up a little bit and talk again about this stage and try to understand what we're looking at. Um, so let's think about what the site prep did and didn't do in this picture. Next slide. So in long leaf restoration, um, I think we all agree that good site prep should assist with the successful establishment of long leaf pine. It ought to control hardwood competition to do that. But then here's the point at which I think maybe um, some of our approaches uh, deviate from a more typical, uh, you know, old school forestry way of doing things. I think good site prep should conserve keystone species. Um, I think good site prep should allow prescribed fire soon after planting. I think we all want that, but how, how you know, what are we doing to make sure that happens? I think good site prep should maintain botanical diversity or at least allow it to recover fairly quickly and it should discourage weeds. Bad site prep, on the other hand, is probably going to prevent the successful use of prescribed fire. It's very often going to encourage weeds like dog fennel, maybe some of the exotics like climbing fern and crotillaria. Oftentimes, blackberry comes in pretty thick. Um, and very often, bad site prep is going to eliminate, maybe permanently, a lot of the botanical diversity that makes a longleaf pine forest a beautiful place. It's going to eliminate some of those plants that are unique and special to, to your property that you're trying to um, trying to hang on to. Next slide. So let's look at this, thinking about site prep again. You know, would this burn? This was a site that was prepped with glyphosate. Now imagine, you know, this is the summertime, but imagine, you know, we've got a couple of hard freezes, we're entering into the burn season. What in this picture is gonna burn? The answer I think most of us know is not much. It'd be very hard to get anything to carry, any fire to carry in this. And so here you are, now you've got your long leaf in the ground and how long are you gonna have to wait before you can burn it? And in the meantime, what's gonna happen? Next slide. How about this one? This was just recently sprayed, would this burn? And the answer obviously is yes. Um, and the reason why is because of the grasses. Next slide. Here's the same stand after a burn and you can see it got a really good thorough burn. Those grasses carried the fire along with some pine needles to help it out. And you know that this this stand was actually had uh, longleaf pine underplanted in some of the gaps in the background, and they burned thoroughly because of that grass. And that's going to help hold woody competition at bay. And so now you've got fire as a tool to 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 help hold that that woody competition out while your longleaf get their roots down, get strong, and initiate high growth. Next slide. So here's another picture of a recent planting, and you can see it didn't burn very well. In fact, the, the fire is just leaving the stand. You can see the smoke in the back. That fire did what it could, and you can see that you know most of those hardwoods that are competing with our longleaf didn't get knocked down. In fact, most of them didn't even really notice the fire. And the reason for this uh, outcome is the site prep. And so this this site was actually mechanically prepped. Um, it was. Uh, Lightly, it was it was ripped and lightly bedded before planting, and you can see if you actually look at where it's black and where it's not black, you can see those rows. So where it got bedded, it didn't burn. Where where in between the rows, it actually burned all right. That's a great example of, of the sort of longer term consequences we that we should be considering when we think about site prep. Next slide. 
And so here's that same stand a year later. And, you know, the long leaf are in there. Yep, they look okay. Yep. But, you know, a lot of them are getting buried in competition. I mean, you can see a few poking out, but there's a whole lot more of them down there in the in the weeds. And those are woody weeds. Those are weeds that are going to be a real problem um, for long leaf survival, long leaf growth. And um, that speaks to my next slide, which is that um, past site prep will leave a legacy that is going to affect land management on that site for decades, probably for centuries. Next slide. So here's an example of that. This is a warehouser stand that we bought in the Sand Hills. And um, I can take one look at this and tell you that 30 years ago when these trees were planted or 20 years, however long ago it was, it was site prep with a massive here. So one, two, there's two things in this, in this slide that tell me that. For one thing, where's the grass? There's almost no grass in there whatsoever because a mazapir remembers a broad spectrum herbicide, just like glyphosate, it's going to knock out your grass and the grass hasn't come back in 20 or 30 years. The other thing it did is it released Let's Reseal And that's really what most of the vegetation in this ground cover shot is, is an invasive exotic that we're struggling to deal with. Let's look at another example of that. Next slide. This is something that if, if you start paying attention, you'll see it all over the place. Where's the grass? The grass is on the side of the road in the foreground where they didn't spray. But back in there in the stand, where's that grass? It's gone. That, that grass got wiped out by site prep. And however old those pines are, 20, 30 years old, that grass has not recovered. And so when we burn, yeah, we've got some good pine fuels to work with, but we don't have the grassy understory that's going to um, really help us with our prescribed fire and that's going to provide wildlife habitat, not to mention all the other plants that got wiped out also, the, the cool stuff like liatris and orchids and sunflowers. I mean, there's it's not there 20 years later, 30 years later. And so a lot of times you'll run into the folks who don't really appreciate the full scale of botanical diversity um, that's in a longleaf system. And um, you know, they'll say things like, well, it'll bounce back. Oh, it'll come back in a few years. You know, and that's generally, in my experience, not true. Um, there are things that do come back. Some of them are native, a lot of them are native, but they're not they're not the cool stuff. They're not the orchids, they're not the lichens, they're not the sunflowers. They're they're the more common things like dog fennel and, and broom sedge and um, you know, they're there's a range of, of responses. Some things might come back in five years. Some things come back in 20 years. Some things come back in 50 years, but you, at some point, you, and a lot of things don't come back at all. And, and you have to start asking yourself, well, what's my stand rotation? You know, if, I, I'm, if I'm managing the stand on a 50 or 60 year rotation, how much of my ground cover is even gonna come back by the time I have to do the next round of site prep? Next slide. So here's an example of um, that same stand where we actually went through and um, planted um, yellow Indian grass. So you can see it, it's that nice chalky gray colored um, grass in the foreground and in the background. It's spreading, it's thickened up, it's really beautiful now. Uh, we hand collected seed from a, a nearby railroad track uh, where there's still some hanging on that, you know, where the site prep didn't get to it. We sent it to Kentucky, uh, to Roundstone. They grew out plugs for us. We put a, a a tree planter on the back of a tractor and drove through here and in and, and December and stuffed all these grass plugs in the ground. And, and a few years later, they came, you know, they're looking pretty big and robust and they're starting to spread. But, you know, think about the time and expense that it took to get one species of the ground cover back and then realize that, you know, in a typical few square meters in, in a good, healthy longleaf system, you're probably looking at, you know, 50, 80 species of, of plant. So that, that really should tell you, you know, how difficult it's gonna be to ever restore ground cover once it's been messed up. So I hope that um, gives you the sense of um, urgency that, you know, if, if you wanna have good ground cover, you're gonna have to protect it when you do site prep. All right, next slide. So we kind of covered the, 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 you know, the background of, of, of ground cover and herbicides. And I'm gonna get a little bit into some of the research that we've done on this now that that uh, looked into some of these issues. So, um, you know, this has been an issue that I think a lot of us have grappled with. My own department has grappled with it for years. We still haven't really settled it. We still have arguments about it sometimes. Um, there's different schools of thought for sure within my own department. Different people put different uh, 
levels of value on ground cover. But anyway, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, we decided we're going to try to at least document the differences between some of our commonly used herbicide mixes. So uh, we did this study. We uh, put in 12 plots uh, in three different areas. I guess we, we uh, put them in in 2009. The areas that we worked on were some montane longleaf at Sproul Bluff, Sand Hills uh, WMA down in Taylor County, and some longleaf wiregrass on Silver Lake WMA. Next slide. Um, one of my co-authors, Alan Isler, came up with the, the, um, the uh, herbicides that we wanted to test. Uh, he has a really great understanding of herbicides. And, and one of the things he was really interested in is, okay, you know, he, you know granted, imazapir at site prep rates is pretty rough on ground cover. In fact, it pretty much wipes it out. But what if we dial back the amount of imazapir? What if we use half as much or a third less? Is there, is there some threshold? where we could use less and, and, and get the same sort of control we like with a Mazapir of woody competition and yet hang on to our ground cover. So um, anyway, on the top are seven different uh, treatments that we used that were for single uh, chemicals. So a different Mazapir, Triclopyr, Metsulfurin, ULWs at different rates. But then on the bottom, we also looked at some of the more common tank mixes where we mixed two different ingredients. So amazapir and metsulfurin was plot seven. Amazapir and triclopyr was plot four. Trying to figure out if, if maybe some of these, at least document what some of the tank mixes are doing and also see if there's one that might work better. And then we also had an untreated control. All right, next slide. We measured, uh, I mean, really got down on our hands and knees, as you can see, and, and measured, documented all the ground cover before we put out the herbicide. And then we did it again a, a few years later. Next slide. Uh, all the plots at least had the opportunity to burn. Some of them carried fire well, some didn't. Um, we had a couple of bad, couple of years of bad drought back then that definitely hurt our longleaf survival pretty badly, especially in sand hill sites. Um, and so it became necessary that when we, when we, and this is the right way to do it anyway, when we try to understand how ground cover changed, all the values are relative to the untreated control because everything's a moving target out there over a few years. And so, you know, if a triclopyr plot had a lot of grass, for example, we would say, well, yeah, that's a lot of grass, but how does that compare to the control? So in 20, 2009 versus 2012, you know, the grass doubled in triclopyr. Well, what if it doubled in the untreated control also? Did that, that tells you the triclopyr didn't really do anything for your grass. Um, so anyway, we, um, we, all the all the values that we measured are relative to the untreated control. And then we also did some things like assigned certain species to arbitrary groups like weedy species or longleaf associates. Next slide. So here's some of the outcomes that we got out of it. Um, uh, these are the different uh, treatment plots along the x-axis. And woody is in red. So if there's more woody than the control as a result of herbicide, it was above zero, it, went, it was a positive value. If there was less woody um, than the untreated control, then it was a negative value in the red. Um, and then the blue is herbaceous. And so there's some interesting things going on. It's a little confusing until you start digging down into the details and then it gets a little bit clearer. Uh, one thing that happened was uh, we got more woody in something in some places that we wouldn't have expected it, like a mass appear. But one of the things we um, called woodies, there's the devil's always in the details with research. One of the things, one of the plant groups that we categorized as, as woody were blackberries. And so I think if you if you've done mass appear very much, you know mass appear is great at growing blackberries oftentimes. So that's what happened there. Um, we also got more herbaceous in some plots. So metsulfurin, which is in the middle with a positive value, got a lot of herbaceous stuff. Uh, same thing with some one of the ULWs. The question there is, is that good herbaceous, like ground cover stuff associated with longleaf, or is there, are these weeds like pokeweed and dogfin? We'll find out in, in the next slide or so. Next slide. So here's where uh, grasses went as a result of treatments. And you can see that some of those herbaceous changes that happen in metsulfurin and ULW were grasses. So we got a lot more grass. Those are clear winners. And metsulfurin, hexazinone, and triclopyr all did a pretty good job of, of getting us um, an increase in grass, at least at certain rates. And that's, you gotta realize is your, that's your fuel when you're trying to burn. So that's something we see as a positive. 
Next slide. Changes in weedy cover. We saw a lot more weeds in some uh, treatments than other. Amazapir was one that grew a lot of weeds. We called things like pokeweed and, and fireweed, ericides, um, blackberry. Those are things we call weeds. They aren't typically associated with, you know, healthy, mature, frequently burned open lawn leaf. Um, so, but if you look, you can also see that metsulfurin, hexazinone, and triclopyr again seem to be some of the better treatments in terms of not getting weedy uh, plants coming in. So those, those more and more as we move through these slides, those three um, chemicals are, are standing out as the winners. Next slide. And here's really the, the where the rubber meets the road. So um, the green is longleaf survival. And you can see because of those droughts, we had some pretty wretched longleaf survival. This is average across all three study areas. And you can imagine what happens in a sand hill when you plant longleaf in the you know December, and then it doesn't rain hardly at all through the spring and summer. We got pretty bad survival. Um, it's just what happens. And you can see that that was generally the case across all treatments. Even the mazapir glyphosate treatments didn't get us great survival, although one of them was, was all right, um, the one over on the right side of the screen. Um, the other bars are the plants that we associate with longleaf ground cover. And so remember again, if it's a positive value, then it means that there are more longleaf ground cover associated plants than the control. Uh, if you look at the metsulfurin in the middle, that doesn't look too bad. You know, the longleaf survival is okay for a drought year, but the ground cover was really good. Also the ULW wasn't bad. Uh, the hexazinone wasn't bad. The triclopyr wasn't bad. If you look at the mazapir way over on the right that got us good longleaf survival, it has horrible longleaf ground, ground cover. So there's a clear trade-off there. You're, you're, you might be getting better longleaf survival, but you're definitely not getting uh, good ground cover uh, survival. Next slide. Well, a picture's worth a thousand words and hopefully we'll get to do the field trip here. I know we're working on trying to get the video to work well for everybody, but um, Here's some pictures of, of some of our study areas. This is in Silver Lake WMA, which is our longleaf wiregrass. These both pictures, the picture on the left is when we started the project before we sprayed anything. And the picture on the right is actually two years after the spraying. Both pictures were taken in September. And if that doesn't tell you the kind of drought we were in, you know, nothing will. Um, so you can see that the vegetation was really struggling from the drought in September of uh, 29, 2000, I guess maybe it's 2012, I'm sorry on the right. But on the top is an untreated control. You can see not, nothing's really changed very much. There's a pretty good carpet of wiregrass on both of them. On the bottom um, is our metsulfurin treatment. And that's that MSM metsulfurin methyl treatment that more often, it's, it's rare that this chemical is used sort of just on its own. It's more often thrown in with something else. Uh, it's the one that's really good at controlling blackberry. But it actually, um, as you can see in the photos, didn't seem to damage the ground cover very much. There's still your wire grass is all still there. A lot of other grasses that are there. And in our findings, we, we found a lot of good forbs were still there too. Next slide. So here is a good example of a comparison of the control on the top again with a mazapir glyphosate tank mix on the bottom. And that's the kind of you know scorched earth approach that we find is often used in, in, in forestry and unfortunately in restoration work. And you can see uh, the, the pretreatment on the left, nice looking wire grass, bracken fern, and a lot of other forbs. And on the right, it's pretty much a parking lot. It's um, just needles on the ground and not much else. Um, and no place for a, a quail to hide for sure, right? Not very good wildlife habitat. Next slide. Here's one of the treatments that Alan was so interested in where we're trying to dial back the rate of amazapir that we're using. Um, on the top is the control, on the bottom is the amazapir, and you can see there was a pretty heck of a large impact uh, on ground cover again there. This was a lower end rate of amazapir, but it's still really pretty much uh, cleared out the vegetation. No place for a quail to hide. A few little sprigs of wiregrass hanging on, a few other odds and ends, but for the most part, the ground cover is gone. Next slide. Now we're moving north a little bit. This is up in the Sand Hills in Taylor County on that, that plot. You can see the control on the top. And on the bottom is our that same tank mix I was just talking about, a mazapir glyphosate. Um, you can see there's actually some tougher, tougher stuff in the Sand Hills that didn't really get knocked out by 
the imazapir glyphosate, things like yucca, uh, survived it okay. But if you notice, there's um, a lot more bare ground, and that bare ground was occupied by grasses. So uh, with that tank mix, even in the sand hills, we lost our grasses. And you can look at that picture on the lower right and ask yourself again, would that burn? Imagine you've got 200 acres of that. The answer is no, it's not going to burn. And so you lose your fire as a tool to control woody competition um, when you use that tank mix uh, pretty much anywhere. Next slide. All right, and here again in the sand hills is our, is our untreated control on the top and our trichopyr on the bottom. Uh, this is a very high rate of trichopyr. Trichopyr again was something that um, doesn't kill grasses. You can see it did a really good job of controlling the hardwoods though. There's persimmon and sand post oak and things like that that got burned back and is dead. Um, the yucca survived it somehow. I don't think anything will kill a yucca. Uh, but notice all the grasses that are doing so well. And imagine now it's a, you know, February and those grasses are brown. Ask yourself, would that burn? And the answer is yes, it would. Um, is there wildlife habitat there? For sure, is there cover at least? Um, so trichopyr again, you know, showed up as a, as a pretty uh, likely candidate for, for um, uh, good site prep. Next slide. Um, Karen will probably make this available somewhere also, but if you're interested, we published this data uh, a few years ago in this brochure, maybe you've seen it before, um, but if you just visit researchgate.net and search on the phrase, is your site prep helping or hurting, it'll pop up as a pretty quick return. Um, and you can download it as a PDF and, and study it and hopefully get something out of it. Um, we printed like 11,000 copies of these and they've actually all been given out. So that, that makes me feel really good. Hopefully a lot of people have um, found it interesting. But from, the, from this study, we've been moving on into other things and I'm gonna talk about those now. Next slide. So um, we haven't been doing nearly as much, uh, you know, crawling around on the ground, looking at our plant community. I feel pretty good about that. Um, at this point, and we've we've really landed on uh, using the research that I just presented to develop a preferred site prep prescription that we're using pretty widely when we restore longleaf on on the tracks that I manage um, and on other properties. Um, and so what we're using now is 48 ounces of Garlon XRT, which is the triclopyr. Remember, that's the stuff that gives, leaves pretty good grass. In our study, we used 128 ounces. We've dialed that way back and we're finding it still gives us good control. And then two ounces of metsulfurin methyl or MSM. That was another one that seemed to have promising results. We dialed that back considerably too. But combined, these two chemicals do a really good job of giving us um, hardwood control while maintaining good grasses and even maintaining most of our good wildflowers and other wildlife plants. We've um, this is even still a little bit out of date. We, in the, when I wrote this, we'd applied it to seven sites, totaling about 3,000 acres. We're using it you know, all over the place now. I'm, I'm gonna guess we probably passed 20,000 at this point of, of stuff that I've done. Next slide. Here's an example of what you can get with it. This is on Squirrel Bluff WMA. Got a bit of a sweet gum problem, a little bit of some oaks in there, but mostly sweet gum. This was a photo point. So we're gonna go through a series of photos that are in the same stand and pretty much in the same place. So this is, pre-treatment and then we got on our, our tractor with our boomless sprayer and went through and sprayed it down and burned it. And I think the next slide is about four years later. Next slide, same spot, looking in the same direction. Pretty amazing difference. Um, so here, moving forward another few, few more years. Next slide, this is right after a burn, but you can see we're still have a really nice park-like effect. It's looking good, hardwoods are under control. Um, like I said, I think that first slide was maybe 2009. I think we're up to about maybe 2016 in this photo. And I ran out there last week and took a photo. Next slide. And this is what we got. Still looking really good. And the reason for that ultimately is the, is the, is the site prep that we did. And you can see the long, underplanted longleaf are coming up and looking all right in there. But, um, you know, that the site prep that we used maintained our fuels and we've been able to have this stand on a two-year rotation and that has continued to hold the hardwoods at bay. And that's the thing you got to remember is that, you know, when you do site prep, yeah, you can knock them all down hard, but what is going to keep those hardwoods from coming back in in year three, year four, year six? If you don't have your grasses and you can't burn, your hands are tied behind your back and your long leaf are on their own. And so, but if you can, if you can keep your, keep your good ground cover and keep burning, 
you've got a great tool, a great ally of Longleaf. We all know Fire is the great ally of Longleaf Pine. Next slide. Well, how did the Longleaf do when we do the Garland XRT and the Escort mix? Um, here's some 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 data. Um, we've done we've compared. So the the blue are um, where we used our preferred mixes, and the black fonts are where uh, in the same year um, some adjoining tracks or some private landowners that we work with sometimes used other uh, mixes, particularly a Mazapir. Next slide. So what you can see here is that with our preferred mix, the Garland Escort, we're getting uh, on these six uh, or these four tracks, we got about 74% survival. And the two brown, two uh, um, black tracks uh, that where Mazapir was used, we got essentially the same survival, 79% survival. And in fact, um, we do typically get better survival than that. Really what drug down our, our preferred mix survival was one planting on the top right where it says fall lime sand hills WMA. We had a pretty bad drought again in the sand hills and we only got 45% survival. It really had nothing to do with the site prep. Just about everywhere they got pretty bad survival. Um, if you if you drop that one from the data, we're actually more in the well into the 80% survival, like 85, 86% survival in two years. So next slide. All right. Didn't want to PowerPoint you guys to death, but I do want to thank um, my co-authors, my friend and co-worker Alan Isler. He was really the, the person who cooked up this idea. Um, great guy and very gifted land manager, now the chief of game management. And also um, my better half, Dr. Joyce Klaus. Um, she's a wildland firefighter at uh, Profession Wildlife and also has her own consulting business, but she's great with data and she did a lot of the data analysis for me. Um, and then hopefully we'll also get to look at a video that was shot a few years ago by the Forest Stewardship Guild that's Pro Bluff, where we reviewed some of the most recent data, including some wildlife data, looking at quail occupancy and biofilm sparrows and other things um, and some of these various treatments. And last, I want to thank uh, Plum Creek Timber, who's now now Warehouser, um, but they allowed us to put uh, the Montane Longleaf plots on their property. So they were a big help in that regard. And um, hopefully Karen will have some good news for us about um, the uh, the next, uh, next stage of this uh, presentation. We're going to go visit, hopefully, Spruill Bluff WMA. This is a shot of that iconic over, overlook that you see coming into the area. Um, you can see some smoke in the background that may have had something to do with that, but hopefully we're going to get an up close and personal tour of Spruill Bluff um, and, and get, you'll get to see some of these site prep in action up there. Um, and I'll, I'll wait to ask questions until after we watch the video, assuming it works. If not, I'll take questions, um, you know, once we talk to Karen. What's up, Karen? How's it, how's it looking for the video? Good. Um, thank you for that, Nathan. That was that was great. Really informative. Um, so we do have a video. Um, I do want to let people go on time. Um, so we're kind of butting up to that. I was thinking we could just skip to that section about the wildlife impacts and kind of wildlife dynamics in the sure. video. Yeah. Um, but I think Jacob has got a question in the meantime while I queue that up. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, when you were referencing Spurl Bluff, there just a second ago could any of could that track or any of those tracks uh, be restored with just fire alone or are you always or most oftentimes relying on a combination approach definitely a combination um i've seen a lot of attempts to restore uh long leap with fire alone and they don't work very well very poor survival but here here's an interesting thing that showed up in our data actually was you know we looked at our untreated controls and what we found there was actually a decline in ground cover, in longleaf associated ground cover, which is kind of surprising when you think, well, that didn't get sprayed with herbicide. So how did we lose ground cover? The answer is we lost ground cover from woody competition. And so on Spurl and on Sandhills, um, our untreated controls lost their longleaf ground cover over time. Not all of it, but they lost a lot of it um, because the, the sand post oak was coming in and, and just taking over and shading everything out. But that's a great question. A lot of people, that's certainly a question I asked myself in the beginning also. And my experience has been, it doesn't work very well, unfortunately. Thank you, Nathan. Just got our video ready now, I think. Yep. Okay. So tell us a little bit about the wildlife and how they were affected. 
Yeah, so we've actually done a multitude of bird survey plots throughout all these different experimental areas. Um, on the old growth site at our first stop, we had 17 bird species per plot on average, which is pretty good. That's a, that's a pretty high, high species richness. Um, half of the plots in, in our old growth treatment area where we didn't use any herbicide, we just did the fuel wood thinning and have been burning, uh, half of those sites had quail on them. Here in the Amazapir area, uh, we had 15 bird species on per plot on average, so not really a statistically significant difference. But what was significant was that in all the stops that we did in this Amazapir treatment area, we had no quail. And so uh, we also had no backman sparrows in here. And so, you know, it's not that you never get quail in an area that's been site prepped with Amazapir, but given the alternatives, um, I think they're over there in the old growth where there's a whole lot more food and better cover. And this is sort of second string or third string as far as they're concerned. They'd really rather not use this. There's really not a lot of good escape cover for them. There's not a lot of food diversity. I'm sure the insect diversity is probably a lot less as well. So this is the third site in our project where we were evaluating the effects of site prep on ground cover and on bird species. And um, well, this site was uh, sprayed in September of 2016 with two ounces of Escort and 48 ounces of Garlon XRRT. We did it an aerial application. Uh, it was hand planted in December 2016, 605 feet per acre. Um, so it's a, it actually was a, planted a year behind the second plot that we looked at. So they're the long leaf are a little bit smaller, but they're gonna catch up in no time. Um, the current survival on this plot uh, is uh, 554 trees per acre, so about 91% survival. So much better survival here than on the broadcast of Mazapir plot. That probably was just year to year variation. What we've been seeing where we've done this elsewhere is that the Garland Escort uh, is giving us comparable survival to broadcasts of a Mazapir or just a glyphosate. Um, so what, what do we keep in the way of ground cover? Well, there's a lot of good news here. If you see the flags in front of us, this is the, the, our measure of ground cover diversity. Um, we actually had 45 plant species here. Uh, that's actually five more than the, the reference side, the untreated control. Uh, 12 of them are grass, four legume species, five hard or soft mass species, and 15 pollinator species. And there's about a 45% overlap between this plot and the old growth uh, untreated control. So about half of the species that are in the untreated control are here as well. So we kept about half of the ground cover or maybe a little better even. So um, that's really great news. That had a profound effect on the wildlife habitat. So the bird species here, we had 18 species per plot on average. And every single plot that we sampled out here, about 20 of them had a bobwhite quail uh, detected during the bird survey. So the quail love this. There's great plant diversity. There's great food diversity. There's great bugging. The cover is excellent. We're getting really good uh, longleaf survival. Um, it's just a win-win. And so this is really our preferred way of doing site prep at this point. The, the old way of doing things with broad spectrum herbicides, blasting everything, and, and, and really being heavy on your competition control, that's the old way of doing things. Um, we found, uh, and many others have found also, that using more selective herbicides are giving, a, are, we're hitting the same longleaf survival, we're hitting our objectives for longleaf and growth, um, and, and then on top of that, we're keeping our plant diversity and we're keeping our wildlife. So I really encourage you to look into, into this type of uh, uh, more uh, um, nuanced approach to doing your longleaf restoration rather than just nuking a site and starting over again. Cool. Uh, I guess we'll just jump right into questions while we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, uh, one of the questions, Nathan, for for areas where you don't have any ground cover really to begin with, or whether it be a cutover, ag site, whatever it may be, do you have any tips for ground cover restoration there? One, and this is more philosophy than science, but um, I don't ever give up on a piece of land. Um, you know, if it's a piece that is literally a Bermuda hayfield last year and now I'm putting longleaf in it, that's, that's a whole different shoot and match. I honestly don't have enough experience to speak intelligently about that. Um, there's a lot of good research on, by other people who, who do. But, you know, a lot of what we're looking at at Spurl Bluff is old ag land. It was ag land 50 or 60 years ago. And we're finding gentians. We're finding uh, a, a state record sunflower that we didn't know was in the state of Georgia until we found it on Spurl. There's, there's good stuff all through there. And um, I, 
I think once you start taking care of a piece of land, you'll be surprised at what starts showing up. So um, old, old field sites are definitely not a, you know, a permission to just nuke it and do whatever you want with it. I think there's always something good on just about any piece of land. And it's surprising how fast things come back. Um, you know, on my own land in Monroe County, I've been treating it for about 20 years and, and I'm finding all kinds of great stuff out there now, you know, that I didn't plant. Uh, lopsided Indian grass, or I'm sorry, Elliot's Indian grass, little blue stem, a whole bunch of liatris. It's, it's lovely. So, and it was a cornfield 20 years ago. Man, there is hope. Yeah, it's mostly, to be fair, most of it's coming off of a pine plantation, well, pine stand that was adjoining it. And it, 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 it held on to some seeds, held on some plants through the ag period, and it's blowing in from that and, and, and moving into my field. And it's taking it, you know, it might be another 50 years before my whole field is a little blue stem, but it's, it's slowly working its way across. So I guess we got time for one more quick one. You, you mentioned earlier on your Mazapir slide, uh, you touched on Cerecia lespidiza for a minute. What's been y'all's best uh, for people that have particularly aggressive infestations? How do you how do you combat that? There's a pretty good publication. I'm, I wish I could I wish I was better with names because they deserve good they deserve the credit. But they they looked at um, how to control Cerecia and Garlon uh, and Escort. Ironically, the two chemicals that I really like uh, are good with Cerecia, but you have to use them at higher rates. Higher probably higher rates than what I'm recommending for our site prep. But I, I have it on my property. And um, that's what I use. And, and you can kind of go back and forth between the two. I, I spray usually in like late spring and then again in like late summer and, and try to, it's, it's, I've never been able to, I still haven't gotten rid of it, but I've been able to marginalize. It. I've gotten it to where there's very little of it. It has a horrible seed bank though. Those legumes can hang on for probably a century or better, even after, even after you've been spraying. Well, I just wanted to close up here. Um, first of all, thank you to Nathan for sharing that information, uh, for doing the work on the ground too, to, to give us some options um, with with herbicides and site prep and um, providing us all that data and really showing showing those effects. Um, you can see the rest of that, um, that video clip. Uh, we just showed a small sliver of it, but you can see the rest of it that's linked to to this webinar's homepage um, where you where you began today. Um, you can see that in full. Um, I've also uh, linked a copy of that brochure that Nathan mentioned that um, that 11,000 <laughs> copy yeah. um, running of it. Um, you can it's available by PDF. You can find it online too if you if you lose that link. Um, and then also a, a link to some of Nathan's other work on ResearchGate. So I want to explore some of his other topics there. Um, so yeah, thank you, Nathan, for doing this. Um, the Longleaf Alliance will be holding more webinars this fall and winter. So um, just keep an eye out for those announcements through the uh, forestry webinar portal, um, or you can sign up for our monthly newsletter on longleafalliance.org. Um, so thanks everyone for, for sticking around and uh, sharing your lunch with us. Hope you learned something and, um, and yeah, stay in touch. Uh, just remember to stay on if you need those CFEs. Thanks for coming. I appreciate the interest and thanks for the opportunity. It was, enjoyed it. Definitely. All right. See you next time. <laughs>